This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. It's no different than being a professional baseball player. You can't be a one-trick pony. You have to be a five-tool player in order to succeed in this game. This is the Power Producers Podcast. Production redefined. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Today, Kyle and I are lucky to spend some time with Mr. Steve Holly. Steve, what's going on, man? Not a whole lot, man. I appreciate you guys having me on. It's an honor. Absolutely. Are you kidding me? Pleasure is all ours for sure. I mean, you're my, you're my uh, one of my HubSpot mentors. I, I would rather you be my HubSpot mentor than Chris Green any day <laughs> of the week because I don't know that anybody can create whatever mad science that guy's whipping up. <laughs> yeah, he's totally next level. It is, he, he I mean, calls every couple of days with something I just can't even understand, but <laughs> I, I'm very appreciative. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm serious. It, it's crazy because I love the guy to death, but I mean, I'm just sitting here looking at how much time he's spending on HubSpot, and I realize he's making forward progress and that everything is is like automated and doing what he wants to do. But So like, what's he doing? Is he he's just building out like crazy... Dude, I mean, no, he's got like web forms and referral forms. Uh, yes, all this stuff that comes in, like literally everything is completely automated. He can pre fill documents in there. Like, See, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, I, I feel like uh, uh, some level of automation is necessary, but if everything's automated, it's like, well, it has to be for him because he just isn't that big. He doesn't have a huge team, right? So, true. You know, for Plus him, with all the stuff he's generating from all the videos he's doing, I'm sure, like we were talking about yesterday with, uh, I don't remember who, who it was that we were talking about, but it, it, he's got to have just be getting blown up in his personal messages and Facebook and all that with different stuff coming in all the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing with the thing with uh, Chris, that's the most impressive that I like about what he's done with his HubSpot is that if you refer business to him, all of the correspondence gets shot out automatically, but it's coming right. from you as the, mm. as the person who referred it into his agency. So it's pretty, that, that is cool. I remember him talking about that. Yeah. Well, the other thing too, and, and you know, it's always big. One of the things I always try to do is to make sure that the technology doesn't replace it enhances, you know, the, well, that's the same the thing. Personal Hanley, contact. Yeah. That's what Hanley put out this week. He made that he, Ryan Hanley put out a post along those lines. I'm the same way, man. I mean, we're in a business where it's relationship business. And I mean, with Chris, I understand why he's doing the things he needs to do. There's no other way for him to combat the volume that he has of in, inbound stuff. But, you know, technology should never replace us. You know, it should only right. make us better and you know smarter, not working hard, but working more efficiently and still getting the same things done. And so, right. hey, ladies and gentlemen that are just now to, you know paying attention, if you thought this was the Chris Green show with three hosts, <laughs> not, I actually want to hear about Steve. So why don't you tell him a little bit about your backstory, man, and how you got involved in uh, the insurance industry? Uh, great question. Uh, I've, I've uh, been an agency owner since 2000, so started my agency scratch. Uh, we do a little bit of uh, personal and commercial. We are very much what you you know consider a generalist type agency. Um, you know, uh, we do you know get into some middle market accounts, but that's not our bread and butter. We know we're kind of stretching when we do those things. Um, but uh, yeah, just started out. I had a friend in the business. Uh, it seemed like a good way to make a living. I ended up uh, doing life and health on the State Farm. Uh, State Farm offered me a job that re would require me to move. And I said, forget that. I like mm -hmm. where I'm at. Just built a house and went, I, uh, 
gosh, I was like 24 years old when I started my agency. Oh, so yeah. So I didn't wow. know what I didn't know. I guess I, I was, was still in college. I think. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can promise you I was There's a 100% chance I was in college at 24. Well, you know, at that point, I guess I was young enough and arrogant enough to know, hey, I'll, it'll just work. You know, right. no, no problem. I'll be yeah. able to make it work. So uh, I guess I didn't know what I didn't know. And uh, so and it has. So I, I've been very blessed to be in a, a good business with good folks uh, around me and, you know, met a lot of great folks like you and, and have kind of helped me along the way. And that's where we're at. Where Where are you guys? We're in uh, Southwest and Central Virginia. Okay. Yeah, you've got a okay. couple offices, right, Steve? Yeah, we've got three. Uh, our, uh, today I'm in our Rocky Mount, Virginia location, and we also have locations in Roanoke and Lynchburg. Good deal. Yeah. Good deal. Well, I mean, listen, I you know I don't think it's what, that you that you were young and arrogant. I just think you believed in yourself, and you have to do that to be successful, regardless of how old you are when you start your agency. Um, Right. You know, or just get pissed off enough that nothing's going to stop you, which was what my case was. So, uh, right. you know, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think that, that all of us have to have some level of belief in ourselves that we can make anything work if we're willing to work hard enough. And guess what, man, I'm not afraid to take a butt kicking. Been there, done that. I've had my That's rear end kicked multiple times. And I just it's a matter of can I get up one more time than I'm knocked down? I think right. your fears might be a little bit different too. Like as a 24 year old, you're, you're kind of, you know, I, I don't think like you said that it's, that, that it's arrogance necessarily, but you're, if, if, if it doesn't work out, like you're 24, you can do something else, right? Like if you're, if you're 45 and you started, you know, start your own agency and, and that you got all your chips in that basket. <laughs> yeah. If it doesn't work <laughs> out, then you may be in a rough spot. Well, so you, think, Listen, I man. That, I mean, I think that's part of it too. When I was that age, you know, at 24, I didn't have any kids. You know, I started my right. agency. I had four kids. The, old, the oldest was two. You know, that's, yeah, right. that's, that's pretty ballsy, you know, to just pressure, say, you know, I'm going to go do it. And that's why I did it. I knew mm -hmm. if I had that pressure that I would do whatever it took for me to be able to, to push things to the next level. And, you know, here we are. We'll see if I ever get there. But, I mean, it was – you know, it's, it's been an interesting experience. So you guys are kind of main street, right? I mean, it looks like you're, you know, when people talk about the all American independent insurance agent, they should have your picture there based on <laughs> what, I, what I see, you know, from community involvement to branding, to, to the type of business you write, um, you know, what, what kind of things are you doing inside the agency right now? I mean, three locations, I'd say you made out okay, you know, for somebody starting their agency at 24 and not knowing what they were doing. But how have you how have you grown? I mean, what have you done to to get to that level? A lot of it has been the, you know, the good old, you know, belly to belly going up and meeting people in the community and that sort of thing. Uh, we believe a lot in the community. Uh, we are not the guy that's going to, uh, you know, go out and, and blitz the area with, you know, advertising and that sort of thing. We truly believe in the relationship stuff. Uh, it, it means a lot to us. We intentionally, you know, try to be neighborly and community oriented and, and that sort of thing. And we try to do it in our own way. So, uh, you know, one of the uh, more recent things that we did is we gave out some care packages to police officers in our area. Um, you know, they, especially at the beginning of COVID, uh, you know, and they've taken some lumps even since then, of course, but yeah, uh, you think, <laughs> You know, but it's like, you know, some of these folks that, that are not really appreciated, but these are the people that if something goes down in my office today, they're the ones that are that are running sure. towards it instead of away. So uh, we just try to make sure that we're always appreciative of that thing. Uh, but, you know, the other thing that we've done is we, we have acquired a few agencies over the years. That's why I've ended up with the multiple locations is uh, that we, we purchased those and it was markets that we wanted to go into. And and um, so that's worked out well for us as well. I think that's, um, you know, that's always interesting when I hear people talk about making acquisitions. It's not something that's really crossed my mind a lot, but I think that it's going to be more and more at the forefront of my mind over the course of the next year or two, because I think that agencies are probably, I'm not saying every agency, but I think there's going to be a good subset of agencies out there. They're going to sell for much less than what mm -hmm. they were because COVID is natural selection. It's forcing people to adapt or, or, or adopt new technologies that a lot of the, the old school agencies just aren't willing to try and learn it. Or they're at the point of their career where they're just like, I'm not going to invest trying to 
spend money into this and learn it. I, I'll just sell my book and move on. And I, we actually had somebody, Kyle, do you remember who it was that, th- but their whole theory was, nah, you know, there's people that are just going to let their business fall off. You know, they're not going to do much to service it. They'll keep a minimal, minimal role. But as the attrition starts to happen, you know, because they feel like <laughs> it's a crazy theory, but in, in their mind, they'll make more money if they hang on for another five or six years doing much less work than if they just right. it for a multiple right now. I just think that if you want to buy a, an older, I wouldn't say, you know, the well-established, but smaller agencies, you're going to be able to find some value out there is, is what I'm thinking. And that, that may be something that piques my interest. Um, if for nothing else, looking at carrier contracts to see who they right. have that I might not be able to get. We've, we've pretty much got what we need, but um, there's a couple that I want that I can't get appointed with because they're just not appointing. So, right. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm in the same mode. Uh, I'm not necessarily looking for any other acquisitions, but if I did, it would be something strategic like that. There are a couple of carriers that I would love to have. And if I could go into a situation where I can buy that with a book, you know, ready to go with it, then I would, I would be open to it. Uh, but you're right. You know, I think, uh, you know, it, the, the, acquisitions that I've made and at least the experience, you know, I've made some and there's some that I haven't made, but I've, I've been in, in talks with them and there's always something besides the money that causes them to do it. And you're right. If somebody wants to just run the string out on their agency and continue to, you know, crank money into their, their checking account and that sort of thing, they can. I think most agency owners, especially if they built the agency themselves, they're probably a little too proud to do that. That's and- exactly what I was going to say, man. It's not that I don't understand how the numbers work. It's that I wouldn't want to let the legacy that I leave behind exactly. be, hey, this guy quit and kept taking a paycheck. I mean, that's basically right. what you're telling everybody. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, when, so you're, I- when you're going and looking for one of these acquisitions, what are the kinds of things that you're looking for? You know, I guess uh, – Somebody you probably ought to talk to, Joe Clevenger. He's helped me a lot with this. Uh, but you know, you've got to know the financials up one side and down the other. And the way that agencies are moving now, you've got to know that pretty quickly. Like you've got to be able to take you know a few key numbers, plug that in, and be like, all right, there's probably something here. There's probably not because you know people are snatching up agencies right and left. Um, but you know, I'm I'm usually looking for something that that fits with what we do already. Uh, we are preferred agency. We don't, you know, go out and do, uh, you know, crazy risks or, uh, you know, any of the non-standard, you know, auto, that sort of thing. It's just not who we are. So I want somebody that sort of aligns that way. And then, you know, just to see if it's something that we can fold in the, the money you can usually work out. I mean, there's usually a deal to be made, uh, but it's like, you know, what is the reason that you're trying to get out? And if that's something that you can live with as the new owner, then great, you know, uh, but, but the cash usually works out for both parties. Yeah, I agree with you. Joe's a good guy. He and I have talked, you know, on several occasions and we need to get him on here to pick his brain a little bit. They run a good shop. Yeah, and he had kind of, you know, he's really, really solid on the numbers side of it. And, uh, you know, kind of let me know that, yeah, here's the few things that that I would be looking at. And he's made some acquisitions himself. And he's like, you know, once you figure those out, then it's about working out the details. And, you know, is it going to be a good cultural fit? Do they have, you know, employees that would come over and, and smooth the deal and, you know, make it work for everybody? So, yeah, I think culture would probably be one of the biggest things, especially mm-hmm. if you're buying like Kyle. We're, I think it was on a podcast, but I don't remember if it was, but we were talking to somebody. And they were looking, Mm -hmm. they were looking to pick up an agency and like the staff was all, oh no, it wasn't, it was, sorry, it wasn't a podcast. It was a different conversation I was having, but like 75% of the staff was like almost 70 years old. Right. (laughs) You know, (laughs) and I'm just thinking that's probably not what I'd be looking to go after because number one, and look, Mm -hmm. I'm not throwing off on 75 year olds. I need probably at least one in here to keep us in shape, you know, but <laughs> because I can promise you it's being done by the book in the way that it always has been. And that's right. That's the biggest issue for us is going in and something's that established. You're just, I'm not going to do very well with, well, here's how we used to do it. You're it's looking such a, for the lady who still smokes cigs at her desk and, and, and manually types out the policies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's the thing, man. I, I'm not going to do well with, you know, back when we were at such and such, this is how we did it. Or no, we've always Listen, done it. This grandma. Way. It's not like that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'll turn into Ben Stiller and happy Gilmore. <laughs> <laughs> well, or at least know that when you're going now, into it. The name tag. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least know going into it that that's your challenge, right? So if if the deal's good enough and everything else is in place and you're like, eh, the one thing I'm going to probably have to do is clean house at some point because these folks are – you know, either dying or leaving at some point in time, then, you know, all right, I'm either equipped to handle that challenge or I'm not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, so what's the biggest challenges that you faced when you've made these acquisitions? One, the, not necessarily in the negotiations, but once it's done, what's the biggest issue you've had? Um, you know, there's always surprises in any book that you buy. Uh, the most recent one that we got, there were quite a few that we ended up having to work through, uh, more or less had to re-underwrite the personal lines book. It was almost 100% personal lines agency. And uh, we found out that there were some, uh, you know, there was some bad risk in there. There was some, uh, you know, they hadn't really paid attention to the discounts and, and things like that, that, uh, you know, people were getting. And so there was, uh, we're coming in as a new owner and then all of a sudden we're raising rates on people because they were getting, you know, discounts that they weren't supposed to and different things like that. And so, you you know, we've, we're, uh, you know, far enough into that, that that's working out for us now. So, you know, it's not a, not a problem, but you know, you're always going to have something that comes up, but that's part of the fun of this business is you don't necessarily know what the challenge is that day. No, not on any given day. It's something different every time. I'm interested with, with the example that you gave, how have you overcome that? How did you deal with that, that you're having to completely underwrite this personalized book and people are going to get rate increases? What's the damage control look like for that? Well, a lot of it's relationship. And, uh, you know, we don't mind telling the truth. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know how certain things got where they are, and I'm certainly not throwing anybody under the bus and saying anybody was doing anything necessarily wrong or anything like that. But I am the guy that's in charge of it now. So, you know, we need to to straighten this situation out. And, you know, one of the things that's helped us is that we do a, a proactive annual review with everybody. We reach out to everybody by phone uh, once a year. Um, and so it's sort of been part of that conversation is to say, you know, hey, we see that you're getting – you know, such and such discount. Uh, you've been getting advantage of that without really qualifying for it, but let's see what we can do to cross sell the other lines to make sure that, that, that you get it. So if you do it the right way, you know, it, 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 most people understand it. And, uh, you know, it, the f- several that don't or that haven't, it's like, are they really our people anyway? Right. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, one of the things that we're doing right now is we're really hammering down on, what I'm going to do with personal lines in our agency, because I ended up with personal lines as a result of going to innovation 2019. Prior to that, we were commercial only. And I let, right. You know, I think I'm going on a streak of three episodes in a row where I've thanked Justin Sloan for talking me into launching Mm -hmm. a, a personal lines division. And, you know, I was, I sat down yesterday with two people here in the conference room in the office and we were, looking at the amount of inbound leads that we have come in on a daily basis, the average revenue side size, all of a sudden I became real interested in personal lines because especially with the way the market's hardening in Florida right now. But I mean, we're doing absolutely nothing to market and we're getting anywhere between five and 10 leads inbound a day, people calling, Hmm. finding us on Google, whatever else. And so I started backing into the numbers and I'm like, holy cow. And I said, so I look, go into HubSpot and I look to see how many of the ones that are coming in are getting closed. And a couple of days last week, Raphael closed like three out of five that came in. And you're looking okay. at $4,500 in premium if it's a home and two autos. And, you know, they're not even having the other conversations they need to have. So I'm I'm backing into all of the numbers and saying, why aren't we having the conversation around life? You know, you're, you're talking to these people about who the lien holder is on their cars and on their homes. That's a perfect segue for you to have that conversation and ask them if they've got enough to cover the money, if something happens, or if they do have life, when's the last time it was renewed? Because life insurance rates have pretty much been going down across the board because people are living longer than they were 10 or 15 years ago. So You know, just looking, just taking the time to slow down and look at that stuff. I'm a little bit more invigorated to put some money behind marketing personal lines. And now that we've got some decent processes in place to to make that work. But I mean, same thing on the umbrella, right? We we had Kilgo on earlier, early on in, in the podcast and just talking about leading with umbrella is common sense and genius all at the same time. And 
again, you know, just from us, the big the struggles that we have, just being completely truthful, is I don't think that our team of people who are working in on getting the personal lines production stuff done, they just don't think the way that I think or the way that Kyle would think. It, it, it's it's it is truly a training process in terms of okay, so somebody's coming in, they're calling in about the home. Well, that's great. One of the first things I'm going to say is, listen, I understand you're calling about your home, and I'm certainly happy to help you with that. I just want to let you know that the average customer who has allowed us to shop their auto insurance has saved 38% on average when they've moved to our agency based on on our work. Would you be willing to let us take a look at your auto today too? That is not a conversation that we have in the middle market. So when I right. when I say that our when I say that our team doesn't think that way, it's not because they're stupid or because they're lazy. It's because that's a different conversation a different approach. than yeah. we than we've ever had on anything. And because it is right. a more commoditized product, but we can deliver yep. some value there at the same time. And I I started looking. I mean, if we put any effort into it at all, we can add a half a million in revenue and personal lines over the course of the next twelve months. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I think you you hit on several of the keys there. You're very process oriented, anyway. You know, I can tell. Yeah, you know, just in the conversations that we've had, like, you know, you understand how a workflow works in automation. It's basically the same way as a process there, and very scripted. So, you know, all you've got to do is kind of train that into your folks. And uh, you know, if you've got good people, you know. Uh, it, that are willing to put that into practice, you you won't have a hard time with it. Well, you know what? Truthfully, man, I'm probably one of the most self-aware people and, and honest about my self-awareness that, of, of anybody that you'll know. I failed them. I mean, the fact that we've had personal lines in place for a year now, and yesterday was the first time I sat down to back into numbers and ask them about how their calls are going and how they would handle this or how they will handle that. We do role play and, and get into the nitty gritty on middle market commercial all the time. And I think that, you know, the issue is part of that though, dude, I think is that we haven't been having the the meetings like we used to. No, I mean, that's part of it. But I think the other part of it is I just looked at it as personal lines being smaller amount per, per case that you bring in. Yeah, It wasn't, it wasn't worth it with the amount of work that we would have to do to get one across the line, you know, almost losing money on, on some cases. It was just like, okay, whatever. Like if it comes in, it comes in, that's fine. But you know, we're not going to focus on it, but right. I think you, you're right. If you have a, if you've got processes in place and, you know, like you said, you sat down and backed into the numbers, it's a different story. Well, I mean, and part of it too is volume. I mean, that's the, that's right. the biggest thing. Steve, I could go out. If I write two dozen new accounts in a year, I've had a banner year in the middle market. Right. Like it's crazy. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I can, and, and people, it blows people's minds when you say that to them. But when you're looking at an average revenue account in the middle market, then it makes perfect sense. I, right. I'm, I'm looking at, at personal lines thinking I need to add two dozen accounts a week, you know, or something like that in order mm-hmm. to make it make sense. And so, you know, what, what is the biggest obstacle is you've gone in and built your agency. And, and I mean, look, I'm not anywhere near as process oriented as you are based on what I've seen in the fact that you even have the workflow for how to change the toilet paper in your office. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Kyle, I'm not kidding. The dude's got a slide on an intranet that shows how he wants the toilet paper in his office changed. With, That's right. With, the, with the, 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 the roll facing out, not, I'm not on the inside. People right. Always, always over that. the top, always over, always the, over top. the top. There you yeah. go. Over the top. That's what I was looking for. Over the top. There's a best way to do everything, including that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> not when you have four kids because that creates an absolute <laughs> yeah. nightmare. Um, yeah, when you get four kids, you just hope you have toilet paper. Yeah, yeah. There I mean, go. seriously, my only goal is that if they start doing this and you know playing with the roll, that it's behind and it's just going to keep flapping over and not <laughs> right. running out. And they're not smart enough to figure out that if they turn it the other way, that they'll get the desired result. But I'm interested in what your um, you know what the biggest things are that you've gone through as you work through making personal lines as efficient as possible. What would you say the biggest time drain on your people was before you solved the problem the biggest by the way for everybody who wonders this is where you invite a guy onto your podcast so he can make your own business better okay so (laughs) i'm taking notes as steve's talking well you know you had said earlier that you felt like that you had failed your people to a certain extent and i think i did that for for years because i didn't necessarily give them instruction and and uh, laser focus, you know, we, my people were writing all kind of business and, uh, you know, it was stuff that either didn't stick or it wasn't the type of business that I was looking for. And I don't think I'd ever really done a good job of defining who our client is, what we 
you know, really wanted to write and then, you know, def defining how we're going to do that. And I think that's really the, the it, people want to be led and they want to know that they're doing a good job. And if you're not showing them that, then it's, it's like you said, you're failing them. And I kind of look at that, like I don't produce in the agency. The The joke here is that if Steve shows up on the production report, something went wrong. You <laughs> it's know. miscoded. They coded yeah, it to so, the wrong producer. <laughs> right. Something got screwed up. And that's not to say that I don't get involved in sales because I do. And, you know, naturally stuff comes to me, but then I turn that over to a team member and I may help them and, and that sort of thing. But I think the biggest thing for me was to just really be able to focus on the market that we wanted to do to, to be in and that we were good at serving because we were spending a ton of time on these accounts that weren't really profitable for us. And it was keeping us from doing a better job for our other clients. And I'm tell you what, man, I'm really glad that I got clear on that before COVID hit because it has made it so much easier for us right now. Our preferred, you know, clientele, generally speaking, don't need to come into my office. They don't, you know, have a, a ton of, you know, day-to-day -day need to talk to us. But when they do, it's important. And they are willing to do whatever needs to be done. Uh, you know, I just talked to one of our restaurants that we insure today. They want to do a Zoom meeting to do some review and and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, so it's just made it a whole lot easier when you've got the type of clients instead of just going out there and trying to write everybody that comes along. You know, so it's funny because I, I use this statement all the time. Sometimes you got to slow down to speed up. And COVID right. has forced us to do that. You know, when we were talking yesterday, you know, I asked, like, what what would be – because I have no benchmarks, you know, I could go into IAOA and post, Hey, how many, you know, how many quotes do you expect a personal lines person to generate on an average day or whatever else? Honestly, those benchmarks mean nothing to me because there's, they're in a different area, different demographic. I mean, all of that goes away, but I was more concerned with, okay, we've got a good, good amount of leads coming in for doing nothing. How long is it taking you from the very beginning of you getting notified about the lead, whether it be, you know, from a HubSpot notification or somebody calls in on the phone to when you would actually have the complete proposal done, video proposal out and be over and done with it. And the numbers were not right. Like I just, it's not a two hour process. I'm sorry. Okay. This is, right. this is personal lines. You know, we use quote rush for home. We use easy links for auto, probably going to consolidate that a little bit. But I mean, and again, we're having to do the full blown deal because we're just now getting into our renewals with easy links where we can click a couple buttons and it'll push it back out. But, you know, what I found was the time drain is that they don't get the information. You know, they're they're having to chase people down for all the information that they need. And, you know, we have the, the stuff that comes in through the website is in a HubSpot form. And they right. have the ability to upload documents and everything to that. But I, you know, uh, that's not where we're getting the majority of the, the inbound stuff from. The majority of the inbound stuff is people picking up the phone and calling. And so right. I told him, I said, look, I said, I'm not telling you this is the right answer or the wrong answer. But what I would do based on what I'm hearing is say, listen, we have a standard uptake form that we have all of our clients complete where they can give us their deck pages and everything else. What's a good email address for me to send that link to you so that you have the ability to, to easily access it, answer the few questions, and send over the documents necessary for quoting? He's like, well, do you think that they're going to do that? I said, they may, they may not. If they don't, they weren't serious. If they do, they are serious. Like, but, and it's not a waste of your time at that point. But more importantly, and this is what was lost on them, I said, now I've got a name and an email address, so it's in HubSpot anyhow. That's all I really want. You know, right, I right. can let that machine work now to continuously Strip, grip yeah. on them and everything else. Right, because who knows if their renewal is not, you know, for another six months and they're just kind of kicking the tires at this point. I mean, right. and they might hit, hit you back up in two, you know, two or three months, whatever. Yeah, it's, but I mean, that's that's the biggest thing that I found from our from our conversations yesterday. I can understand about not knowing or thinking about rounding accounts or whatever else. But, um, you know, that that is crazy. Like if I'm taking two hours to quote something and the agency on average is going to get seven hundred and fifty bucks and a producer is going to get a certain percentage of that, it's not profitable. But it's the right. difference between thinking like a business owner and thinking like somebody who's not. The first place my head goes is just is is combining, you know, the different lines of coverage to get discounts. I mean, like, why would you not do that? Yeah. Every, and everybody, with every commercial that everyone sees on TV, they know that that's how that, they know that that's how it works. Well, so and it's then not even 
yeah, and then that goes into leading with Umbrella. Steve, we, we're in no man's land down here for packaged business. There is no bundling right. in Florida. Everything right. is standalone home. And if you're going to bundle anything, it may be auto and umbrella. Now, Progressive has the, you know, they bought ASI and all of that, but you can't get a progressive appointment in Florida. It took me almost three years to talk them into appointing us. And we're just now at the point where we can begin to soften the conversation a little bit about getting home an umbrella, but we would be way more successful with them. I have a feeling if we had that ability to package and we don't. So, you know, that's, that's kind of where my head is, but, um, you know, that's in, I, I do agree with you, though. You have to define. And I mean, that's one of the things we talk about in Killing Commercial, too. One of the very first things I tell everybody is you got to identify who your ideal prospects are. I don't think you have to have one. I think you have to have three to five. But you should be able to articulate what that is and then never deviate from it. You know, right. people ask me all the time, well, how do you how do you just, you know, why? How do, how do you only write accounts that are two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand in premium? That's all I prospect. Yeah, I only pro- <laughs> I only prospect accounts that are two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand in premium. That's all I'm going to write. You know, don't take your eye off the ball. And I think that sometimes people take their eye off the ball, or we let them take their eye off the ball, and, and it, it falls back on our shoulders always. Yeah, and you know, a lot of the things you were talking about, you know, how do you get the information, and you know, what's the hold up on all of that kind of stuff, and and you'd mentioned your raiders and all that, and I get it, Florida's different than than most other areas. Now, our shop, we don't have, you know, twenty five personal auto carriers that we write business with. We really don't. Uh, I tell my people I want them to go through at least three, and uh, you know, let's let's uh, look at that. Those three might change depending on you know who's more uh, competitive at a time. We actually dropped our raider. Because we found that we were slower doing the Raider than we, and less accurate than, than going through our carriers because we found, especially one of our lead carriers, they pre-fill most of the prior carrier's information like 75, 80% of the time. So if I have their name, address, and date of birth, it'll find the, the drivers and you know the prior limits and that sort of thing. Quite honestly, you know we try to take the apples to apples thing out of our process. We just don't do that. So I don't really care what their limits are, other than you know you need them to get whatever discount they have for their prior uh, limits. But um, you know we we talk to them up front. You know we know that price is important. Other than price, what else is important to you? And you know we make them commit to that. And uh, so you know we're going to make sure that we're hitting those things you know throughout the process. Yeah, I agree with you on the apples to apples thing. I don't I'm not a big fan of that either. Um, you know, the reason we ask for deck pages is so that we can get VIN numbers, driver's licenses and dates of birth. If they have right. that information and can send it over, I'm perfectly fine with that. And I tell people all the time, I'm not here to cheat off of somebody else's work. I'm my work product will stand on its own. I don't need your policies so that I know how to write them. I need it because you've got information on there that you can either send me that way or you can send it to me the other way. I'm trying to make it easy on you. Right. But I mean, you mentioned progressive progressive does a lot of the prefill stuff. So if you go to your progressive rep and say, look, we're ready to turn this thing up. I know you guys charge us every time that, you know, you pull reports and that sort of thing. What if I commit to you that you're going to get, you know, so many extra, you know, quotes or so many extra shots this month, would you waive that for me? You know, those are things that they'll, they'll look to. And especially I think with the market sort of tightening and your market's always tight. It doesn't matter in Florida. It's always crazy. But- yeah, it's crazy, man. I'm really worried about what, I mean, I shouldn't say worried. What I see happening here is we're going to be where we were in 2004, mm-hmm. 2005, right after we had those four or five storms come through and we really haven't had any issues we had the we had the hurricane that hit in Key West. Irma hit a, you know what three or four years ago. Then we had the one that hit in, in the um, the Panhandle, but it's not like it yeah. was then. You know, and my buddies that do captives and reinsurance and stuff were telling me last summer that there wouldn't be any rate taken on property because the amount of reserves in the reinsurance marketplace were so high they didn't have to do it. Well, apparently that all got depleted over the course of the last year to do due to you know, all the global events and things that are happening. And so carriers are taking rate carriers are pulling out again. And, you know, I don't care. I mean, that doesn't bother me a bit because that really, to be honest with you, enhances our value proposition. So many people think I'm a one trick pony that only leads with workers comp. And they don't realize that when I first got into this industry, I led with property 
And it's because property was the problem that needed to be solved. Workers' comp just happens to be the problem that needs to be solved right now. And if I need to shift back to property, I've already been been there, done that. Or if I need to push to something else, we've already identified three other areas that we can use to lead if people start following what we're doing on the comp side. So it's um it's interesting. And in, you know, to your point. Again, I'm not a big fan of having a ton of carriers. I don't want people coming in all the time asking me for business. I want the few to come in and thank me for the business and, mm-hmm. and never have to worry about volume commitments. So, Well, I mean, if you think about like where we are with, with where we're placing stuff, I mean, a majority of it's with, with a select few carriers. Oh. It's not like we're sprinkling it around on everybody. It's And, and it's based on their appetite and the stuff that we're getting in front of. So, Well, and it, with personal lines too, it's interesting because it's it's – you don't have nearly as much diversity of rates per zip code than if yeah. you have the commercial stuff. Like the the homeowners, you can pretty much figure out, okay, it's going to be right about here. I could go mm-hmm. to five different businesses and have completely different property rates oh, yeah. because it runs the gambit of construction or whatever else. But I mean, we have Safeco, Liberty or Safeco, Nationwide, Progressive, and Auto Owners is who we quote our personal line stuff with and the lion's share of it is going to go to progress progressive or uh safeco every time or right. so, i'm sorry progressive or auto owners every time yeah and your contracts are probably going to reward you for putting more business with with those because you get your contingency bonuses and you know all that kind of stuff so if you're spreading it out too thin then it's hard for you to to maximize the revenue to the agency well you're also not giving yourself enough premium to support the losses that are going to happen so you're going to have inflated loss right. ratios because with my luck i'd have premium spread across four buckets and i'd have a cat loss in each of the four buckets and not get contingency from anybody right right we're looking forward to that contingency, man. This will be the first year we actually get it. Um, we we got appointed with auto owners in September. Well, and the, the reason why, there's a couple of reasons why. Number one, you know, the large bulk of what we what I started with was monoline comp carriers, and they don't even have contingency. Right. So I just yeah. negotiate a couple extra points on commission here or there and remind them that I'm giving them profitable business, and we can usually – do that. But as far as uh, contingencies, we were so, uh, so pumped up because we got auto owners last September. And by the end of the year, we had already met our, almost met our three-year goal for them, you know, in about three and a half months. And I'm like, oh, we're going to crush it. Our loss ratio was 0.0. Oh, wow. We had no losses in the three and a half months that we had them on the books. And so my guy's like, Hey man, I got your profit sharing check. Come on and come pick it up. And I, and he, I said, how much is it for? What do I need to bring a wheelbarrow with me? And he said, and he says, psych. He says, it's 3,300 bucks. I'm like, what? I said, that's yeah. impossible, man. And come to find out it's all based. It's based off of earned premium, not booked premium. I must, <laughs> must've missed that part. Cause we, we booked a ton of premium, but we didn't have very much time to earn it out by the end of the year. So that's why I always joke when people say profit sharing, this will be like the first year that I've really had a good actual profit. Yeah. Sharing. Like a cornerstone yeah. carrier that we have an, a, a ton of business aggregated with. And we, right. we have a good loss ratio with them this year. It's not 0%, but it's still pretty solid. Yeah. Right. Well, and all of those things, you know, I, I guess we talk a whole lot about sales and systems and tools and all that kind of stuff. But if you're not thinking about that kind of stuff in your agency, you know, that that's the, the best way for you to add percentage points to your profit every year is, you know, to make sure that you're maximizing those things. And it's something that I've taken a real push at. We've got one of our carriers that, you know, my sales team and I have, have talked about, we were talking this week. It's like, hey, we think we can get the contingency with this uh, carrier by the end of the year. We need to you know, do everything we can to push some business that way and that sort of thing. And I mean, you know, it, it's sort of like you, it's not going to be a huge check to us this year, but you keep doing that enough times and you keep them on the books for, for long enough. And then all of a sudden that, that starts adding percentage points. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it does. And it's not like it's phony money. It's real. There's some real coin in some of those contingency checks. Right. So I'm, I'm, I am looking forward to that. Talk a little bit about technology. I mean, I know you guys are using HubSpot, and you're certainly, you know, really ingrained in that. Um, what do you? What are the? What are some of the other technology things you're doing in the agency to to help run the business? Yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm 
kind of a tech nerd anyway. It's like anything that comes along, I, I kind of enjoy it anyway. And uh, so, you know, we have uh, moved everything to Max. Uh, we use, which is so weird in, a, in an insurance agency these days, but we, we're all on Max. We have iPads that we use for notebooks and that sort of thing. We don't you know, you really use paper within the office if we can help it. And all those kinds of things kind of seem like, well, big deal. Well, it's time savings is what it is. I can handwrite something in my iPad. Uh, the the program that we use is Good Notes. It's like a seven, eight dollar program. I can circle it and import it into HubSpot right there without having to do anything else to it. Um, you know, just little things like that that we that we do. Of course, we have the VoIP uh, phone systems that are integrated. Uh, we have our our texting platform that's also integrated with HubSpot. Um, so, you know, really one of the things, and I know you know you're big with HubSpot, but the thing that has has really been a plus for us with them is that we don't have to have so many other technologies. Right. We used to have a bunch of different things that we would bolt things together. And it really, you know, I guess it, maybe the theme here is simplifying things, but it's simplified a lot of things for us, you know, within the agency. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. It, it is um, such a freaking massive piece of technology that can do so many different things that, again, you, you have to slow down and look at everything that it's capable of doing and then figure out how you can integrate that with your agency. But we do, we, we use Lightspeed voice for our, our VoIP and it gives us, Same. it gives yeah. us call pops and HubSpot. Um, and we, we use, um, Sakari is the text application that we use inside a HubSpot so that we have the ability to, to text back and forth with our clients, which they absolutely love. And I am so much better at texting from a keyboard than I am my phone. I don't right. have to worry about any bad autocorrect mistakes happening, but, um, you know, I think that, um, yeah, we're also starting to use Vidyard as well. I don't know if you're using that in HubSpot, but I'm, it integrates and it's great. I'm not, tell me how you're using it because I know that that was a native application to HubSpot and, uh, David Lefevre, who does all my HubSpot programming for me had, we had talked about it originally, but we ended up going with Vimeo for one reason or the other on, on their pro platform, and I don't remember why. Yeah, I mean, it's it's much like Loom or any of the others that, you know, you can put a circle of yourself and do your video proposals and all that kind of stuff. But especially now, like, it's how I communicate with my team. It's how I communicate with my carriers. You know, if I've got something that's going on, rather than picking up the phone and calling somebody or trying to set up a meeting or whatever, I do a five minute screen share video and it's automatically integrated with HubSpot. I mean, it's like native to it or whatever. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I get the the notification when it's been seen and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think I can, I just haven't done it yet, but I think that I can even set up automations that once somebody opens that thing, you know, would fire off, say, email communication or text or something like that as well. Uh, but I just haven't gotten gotten that far into it yet to see. Yeah, you could actually um, have that video pop up, create an automation that send an email five minutes after it opens to your prospect asking if they had any questions about the video proposal you just sent to them or Right. Something along those lines, just to give it another touch. You know, I think the thing that's most important about HubSpot, and I actually am booking a call also uh, this specific topic with uh, Wes Anderson to talk about VAs. It's the same thing, though, right? And, and I think that a lot of times that agencies that don't have a technology like this, like, a, like they don't have a CRM at all, or they're not using a virtual assistant, which we're one of those. We, we don't use VAs right now. Um, I think that the most difficult thing is if you don't have your processes mapped out, you have to stop everything you're doing and right. map out your processes and get those in writing first. Correct. Then you can identify what it is that's able to be automated. Then you can decide if you want to automate it or not. Then you figure out how you're going to automate it and then you go do it. Well, you know, I talked to Wes two months ago. I'm sold on, on needing a VA. Trust me, the hours that I put in tell me I need somebody that I can push some of this stuff off onto. But, you know, the biggest obstacle that there is for me to get a VA right now is to take the time to create, you know, videos and screen shares and all of the things for those things that I want to push off to them. I understand in the long term, it's going to save me a bunch of time and energy, but I just don't have the time to sit down and do that right now. I've got to, I'm going to have to hire an assistant just to do that so I can hire an assistant. You know, it's just, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and I don't have the time to do it either. But I, as far as like document documenting processes and all that kind of stuff, I lean on my team as much as anything. Uh, you know, we keep our intranet. Ours is through Google Sites, mm-hmm. and yeah, you know, I ask them if if you're looking for something uh, that's in, we call it our playbook. Uh, if, if it's not in our playbook and you've, you know, have figured out how, how to do it, it, put that playbook entry in there. So I open that up for the team to be able to do it. And then they just send something to me to say, all right, look over this and make sure it, it makes sense or whatever. And we have it formatted. You know, there's a template, uh, basically page that they go into and they know how to, how to structure that thing. And when they put it in there, I may do a little addition or, you know, tweaking some things, but you're right. If you try to do it all yourself, you don't have time to do it. And so I tell everybody it's everybody's job, you know, and I'm open to changing any of our stuff. Like, I don't care if it's my way, as long as it's the right way or it's the best way. And uh, I mean, even down to the toilet paper, if they can convince me that there's a better way to, to do the toilet paper, then we'll change our playbook entry on how to hang the toilet paper. options on that. (laughs) Hey, listen, in all truthfulness, I'm just happy if it gets replaced. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> in, in, in the Valrico office, at least. Correct. <laughs> I replaced my own toilet paper. So I, I've, I've got a question since you guys, I see Steve, you got baseball stuff behind you. And obviously David, I know you're a baseball guy. What's your take on the, uh, Fernando Tatis situation with the three, the three O grand slam. You guys had to have seen this. If you don't want him to hit a grand slam, then throw the ball by him. Okay, thank you. you. Know, or, or put him on. I mean, I I like the unwritten rules, and I like the idea. I mean, quite honestly, it's a little bit. I, I mean, I I coached you know youth baseball and all that kind of stuff. I may or may not have uh, put the sign down to to plug a kid you know, <laughs> from time sure. to time, but you know it it was never because they necessarily you know did did well. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like it, dude, what do you want me to do? I mean, if, if, if you don't want me to, to hit bombs off of you, don't, don't. Right. Don't groove me one. What yeah, I, I, I missed I mean, it. I didn't see it. What happened? So, so they were up like 10, three, I think in the seventh inning or seven later in the game. So they're up, they're up seven runs. Bases are juiced. Don't know how many outs there were, but he's up to bat and it's, it's a three Oh count. So they're all, they're dude, all I'm pissed. Three, three Oh, I'm sitting dead red all day, every day. So they 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 threw him a lollipop and he just <laughs> he yoked it. I mean, what what do you expect the guy to do? Like, yeah, I, 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 in, in my opinion, hold on. But where's the controversy? I don't understand. The opposing the manager, the, the was, Rangers were pissed because he should have just sat on it and not swung because he's right. you know it, it, because it's a three zero and the bases are juiced and they're up by seven in the late stages of the game. I'm like, dude, fuck that, man. I'm I'm swinging for the fences there. Yeah, what do you want him to do? Bunt? Like if yeah, right, if you right, oh, if, if okay. I've got three zero. If I've got 3-0 and my coach has given me the green light, there's a good right. chance I'm coming out of my shoes. Right. <laughs> it's, right. It's, so I, I don't know, man. Like some of the unwritten rules in baseball I think are uh, – um, I'm not a huge baseball guy, but I think they're a bit finicky and kind of old-fashioned. Well, I can tell you right now, the <laughs> fact of somebody thinking that guy should not do anything uh, with a 3-0 yeah, fastball down the middle, that's not an unwritten baseball rule. Now, if you would have told me that he would have danced around like an idiot going to first base because he had None of that. Hit, you take none of that, yeah. and even yeah. after the game, he he almost like apologized right. for hitting a grand slam. Right. And I'm like, right. that, wow. see, and that's and that's and that's the part that pissed me off. I'm like, dude, like this is so messed up that they've got this guy apologizing for for you know absolutely blasting one on you fools. Like, yeah, you suck. No, don't no. be down by seven runs. No, I could like I was right. gonna say, if he dances down to first base like a moron, then right. he's gonna get sweet chin sure. music the next time he's up. <laughs> exactly. Right. That's the exactly. Other- exactly. To run around the bases, sure, whatever. But I mean, come on. That's the unwritten rule that I subscribe to. Is, you yeah. know, we'll, we'll just. I, I, and, and that uh, that one I do agree with. Yeah, and I mean, I don't care for the bat flipping and the showboating and you know all of that kind of stuff. I am somewhat a traditionalist on that stuff. But if you don't want to got to hit a home run, then throw the ball by him. I mean, right. you know, that, that's that's pitch. what it's about. Yeah, exactly. Well, shoot, all man, right. how many times did they intentionally walk Barry Bonds with the bases loaded? Right. Sure. Guess what? They gave up a run to save four. Yeah, it was right. statistically a good move. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's crazy. Right. I, just, I just need I, – I saw that you had the baseball stuff behind you. I know, you know, Dave's history, I just needed to clear the air there. Well, I'm glad we got that straightened out. Yeah. <laughs> if uh, if MLB too. needs to consult with us, then, you know, yeah. we're, we're open to that. Listen, the only thing I took out of that entire exchange is the fact that Holly may or may not have given him the old, you know, split fingers to uh, – <laughs> To drop little Joey Scruggs that's batting cleanup. 
the the sign may or may not have been a middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, man. So um I'm interested in kind of what your thoughts are coming out of COVID. I mean, how much how has this changed you guys and how you're operating right now? Certainly you know, of, everybody's remote, but I mean, what are your what do you think you're gonna see for your agency going forward? Well, we're actually back in the office now, uh, but our doors are locked. So we're doing sort of by appointment only. And uh, I like it. And I think all of my staff does. We've had the sort of ongoing conversation about whether or not this is just how we're going to do business going forward. Because, you know, one of the good things about having HubSpot is, you know, we use the ticketing system on the service side. So we're able to we have a a field there that, you know, basically tells us where the interaction came from. Was it in person? Was it over the phone? Did it begin by email? Was it a form? You know what the deal was. And we found that, like, I think it was 93.5% of our interactions were other than in person anyway, to begin with. So, you know, maybe for us, it didn't affect us quite as much as others, but, uh, you know, we have met with a few clients now in the office who've had some things and they've, you know, set appointments, they come in with masks. We ask them about, we've even got one of the thermometers, you know, to check your temperature on your forehead and all that kind of stuff. But I've asked clients about it. Thank you for they, saying it was on the forehead. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, it's not the other, <laughs> but, uh, but I ask clients about it and they say, no, we like this because I know when I come in to talk to, you know, your staff or whatever, uh, they're going to be attentive. They, they are with me and not waiting for somebody else, you know, to walk in the door or whatever. So I think that's going to be a change that is more than likely going to come out of this for us is that we will operate by appointment only even after it's all done. I would be interested to see of the six and a half percent that were walk-ins, what percentage of time they took of. Right. Versus the people you're dealing with over the phone. Yeah, that's a, that, and I haven't dug into that, but yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I think I could probably get the, at least the ticket time, you know, time from open to close on that. The other thing that I've thought about is, and it's probably anecdotal, but, you know, being able to go through those and saying, okay, which one of those are our better accounts? You know, because we do rate our, you know, clients on the ABCD scale, you know, like a lot of other agents do. And, you know, if somebody is a, a D or a C client, doesn't make them bad people, but they're also not necessarily great accounts for us. You know, it's right. not necessarily profitable to begin with. So uh, that, that I probably need to do some more work on that. That's a great question. It's like well, you're, you're across the street or wherever, wherever he's at. What's that? I didn't, you broke up. It's like like your boy from across the street. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, no. What what had me thinking about it was I went through. Um, I've I've been through a partial demo of Neon. Okay, and I don't know if you've seen. I have any too. Of, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, I just asked too many questions, so that's why it was a partial demo. You know, I've got to get the other half out. But that's the one thing that I took from that that demo was the level of of data that they could drill down into, so that you could look and see. Okay, travelers. You know, I'm spending 30% more time servicing your accounts than I am right. Hartford or Chubb, but yet you're paying me the same commission to do work on your accounts. We need to have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to them this week to, to Seth and Sid both. And uh, I said, the thing that I see with that is it makes you, yeah, all of our carriers say that that we're their partners, you know, well, this really kind of tilts that a little bit more in our favor because we're able to like truly be partners and say, yeah, you know, we love you travelers, but here's what we're finding on, on our end. And this is maybe why you're not getting, you know, as much love from us is because people don't don't like dealing in your system. It takes them a lot longer. There's, you know, whatever the, the uh, differences are there. So, yeah, I mean, what they're doing with data, it's, it's crazy and it's very valuable. And by the way, if anybody from travelers is listening to the, listening to this, that was completely fictitious because we don't even represent you guys. <laughs> well, we do. Uh, and their systems, I will say have gotten better, but they still got a ways to go. So here's my question. Um, Based off of the fact that you use HubSpot now, what agency management system do you use and how involved are your, is your staff in the agency management system itself versus HubSpot? Hardly at all. Uh, We use Xanatech IMS. I remember Um, that now because you're the only other person I know that has it besides Ed Cooper. Yeah, they're, and they're a great little company. You'll find a lot of agencies that represent Erie mm-hmm. use them because they're very you know Erie centric. Um, great customer service, good people. I mean, I can reach out right now and get the head of the company, and and they're very responsive. 
but they're also limited and you know they can't do it really just like everybody else you know they don't have the same functionality as a hubspot or whatever so we use it basically for carrier downloads because i can't get that in hubspot right now we use it for accord forms and uh, that is where we store our documents. So any of our images and that sort of thing, I could replace that if I needed to, but it's a, it's a, we have it. So we use it. You, ba- you basically described what we're dealing with, with Hawksoft. I mean, great company, yeah. good customer service, yep. right? kind of, you know, honestly, very minimally relevant to the grand scheme of things though. Right. We don't put anything in there until we get the download because you never know if the download is going to wipe out what you put in. And right. so- Unless we have to create accord forms for an ENS submission or something, we're just not going to spend a lot of time there. So do you think that Neon is the answer uh, that can put all of that stuff together? Man, I would love for it to be. And I, from what I've seen, I am very encouraged by it. Um, and, and the next question is, is it compelling enough to pull you away from all that you've invested into HubSpot? Yes. Okay. It is. It is. Uh, and I'm really, I'm asking you because... I told them when I got on the call with them that I'm over a hundred thousand deep into HubSpot and I'm not right. a good prospect for them, but I would be willing to be a mouthpiece to help them. Cause I believe in the mission of what they're trying to do. And I, I understood what they're doing, but you know, kudos to them for the product they've built. I've, I've thought about it literally daily since I got off of that. And there's a high possibility and there's enough, there's enough runway time right now from where they're already pre-sold that I have right. time to make up my mind and decide what I'm going to do. But it's, um, well, it's- too, I think there's an advantage coming from HubSpot and, you know, theirs is basically built on Salesforce. There's not much, I don't think that you can do in HubSpot that you couldn't translate to, to Salesforce. So the things that you've already got built out, the automations that you're working, the systems that you have in place, I think you could probably transition those over. And as a matter of fact, I think it would be easier data migration because the two actually have integrations. I mean, you can integrate HubSpot for that matter. If you wanted to spend a ton of money, you could have both. But um, yeah, if I were to do it, I think I would probably have a bit of an overlap, you know, have a few months where you're overlapping the two that way, you know, it makes it easier to transition your data. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the most compelling thing that I see out there from a technology standpoint right now. I, I agree. And I think it's just the level of analytics that they can go to. It makes it foolproof to run your agency for all practical purposes because you can see where every single thing is. I mean, nothing can hide in that system. Um, well, and the it, other thing that's important is the way that they're set up. Like this is not a company that's being formed to sell out to Applied or somebody like that. And the way that they are structured kind of limits that. I mean, this is a an agency-driven, you know, uh, technology that it, you know it should stay that way. No, it's it's being built by a group of people who sincerely believe they can take applied out. Is exactly right. who it is, you right. know, and which is crazy. But um, you know, at the same time, stranger things have happened, right? I I hope they do. I, right. I do think it's it, it's going to change the game a little bit now that um, applied and AMS three hundred and sixty both have launched full integrations with Salesforce as well. And right. so it, it also helps me because the guy who does all of my HubSpot work has been working with a couple of the agencies that are inside Killing Commercial that are applied Epic users. And he's basically building out what Florida Risk has done in HubSpot inside of Salesforce and Pardot for those other agencies. So I'm glad that he's learning those systems and knows them because if I do make that decision, it'll make my migration a whole lot easier. Right. And, you know, if even if those you know, companies get their platform onto Salesforce and that sort of thing. I think it just makes it that much easier for those uh, agencies if they decide that they want to move and they say, you know, I want control of my data as opposed to applied having control of it and being able to sell it to other carriers and, you know, that sort of thing. I want that information. I want that power myself. It just makes it that much easier because you're already on the platform. Yeah, I agree. It'll be interesting and exciting to see what uh, what all transpires with it, man. I mean, I think that uh, I just get a headache thinking about it. Honestly, there's just so much going on there. Um, and it well, just- you know, I look at it as all opportunity. You know, I, I love HubSpot. I'll say it straight out. Uh, you know, all of my team love Hub, Hub loves HubSpot. Uh, you know, it's but at the same time, if something better comes along, you know, we've got to be willing to move on that. And uh, you know, if if that's neon, and you know, I'm hopeful that it is, then then we'll be there. Well, I mean, a lot of people loved horses and buggies too, but they're not right. riding around in them anymore. You know, I mean, right. we got right. we have to evolve. And unfortunately, if HubSpot can't come up with a better mousetrap, 
than their competition, then they lose. That's part right. of the game, you know? Right. So, right. well, listen, man, you got all kinds of good stuff going on up there. I know people are going to hear this. They're going to want to reach out to you and pick your brain a little bit. You've always been generous with your time when I've reached out. So why don't you tell them the best way to get a hold of you and we'll wrap this thing up. Uh, it's probably just easiest to find me on Facebook. Uh, just Steve Holly on Facebook, uh, Holly Insurance on Facebook. It's probably the easiest way to get me. And that's H O L L E Y Holly. You got it. All right, man. Well, listen, Steve, thanks for your time today, brother. I appreciate it. It's been good talking to you. Always uh, enjoy hearing what you have going on up there and uh, look forward to watching your continued success and growth. Yeah, guys, I've enjoyed it. This is awesome. All right, brother. Have a good one, man. We'll talk soon, Steve. Take care. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com.